Just a couple, um, before I call the meeting to order, just a couple guidelines. We like to make sure that um, if you're, you'd like to speak, uh, the person running the meeting will unmute you and please identify yourself by uh, name and address. And I'm gonna turn my phone off if you'll bear with me for a moment, because it's, it's going to ring during the meeting if I don't. Uh, welcome everybody. So uh, I'm gonna call the meeting to order. And uh, as far as who we have seated, let's see, we have Larry Preston, uh, Rich Napolitano, Tom Currier, myself, Alex, and uh, that constitutes our quorum. Uh, that said, uh, Paula, are there any changes to the agenda suggested? No, there aren't. Okay. Uh, the minutes of November 23rd, 2020. Uh, any corrections or changes? They look f fine to me. It's good to me. I'll make a motion that we accept them as presented. Second. Second. Oh man, I think that was Larry. You got in there first. <laughs> any discussion? All those in favor, the members raise your hand. It's the easiest way to poll. All right, yep. Okay, any abstentions? No nays, so that's unanimous. Thanks. Uh, audience of citizens, is there anything anyone would like to bring up to us that is not already on the agenda? From, from the, no? Okay. Um, look, make note that Bob Powell has started, okay. has uh, connected to the meeting. Thank you. Hi, Bob. Good evening. Hi, Bob. Good evening. We voted on the minutes from the last meeting, but that's that's the only point. Uh, we're at audience of citizens in the agenda. Um, no unfinished business, Paula? Uh, no, we have none. Okay, so I'm gonna move into item seven under new business. Uh, this is a uh, M&J bus line site plan application to locate a school bus service facility at nine route 66 east assessors map nine lot seven in the cm uh two zone that said uh how will we unfold this will we have the applicant speak first you certainly can they're here okay and could you again identify yourself for the record if you'd like to speak uh and you'll be recognized uh, i'm ted harris representing the applicant tonight on the Lawyer practicing in Niana, Connecticut. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Is, there, right, is there anyone else here representing also, or are you the sole? No, with, with me is, uh, is Mike Beebe, the principal of M&J Bus, as well as Robert Fanner, who redesigned the layout of the parking lot, and he'll be speaking as well on that issue. Okay, thank you. Why don't you go ahead, Mr. Harris? Okay. So this is an application for a change of use with respect to this, this site. Uh, that application is based on two sections of the regulations. One of them is section 1.31.2, and that, uh, that allows ve vehicular sales and service in this uh, CM2 zone indirectly by reference from the CM2 two zone regulation 32.2, which kicks it back to section 31.26, um, or in this case, uh, vehicular sales and service. So that is the regulatory framework on which our application is being presented tonight. The applicant is M&J Bus. It's a family business that literally started in 1995. It's operated by Michael and Karen Beebe, husband and wife, and their two children. And it has been growing ever since starting in 1995. They service school bus contracts throughout the state of Connecticut and have several right in the general area of this, this facility, which is one of the basic reasons why you wanted, in fact, jumped at the chance of buying this facility because it'll make operations much more efficient for him and, and be, and be a, provide better service to the surrounding towns as well. Okay. 
The building actually it couldn't have been designed better for this particular use. It's not only suitable, it's more than suitable for the use. Um, based on its prior use, it has a variety of equipment within the building, which would typically be used in bus maintenance. Not only that, it has physical facilities within the building that are also important and useful in terms of the bus maintenance. The only thing that really has to be changed in order to use this site efficiently for the, the proposed purpose is to redesign the layout of the parking lot, not enlarge it, not make it smaller, but just re rearrange the layout because of the nature of the vehicles to be parked there. So the proposed use is a maintenance facility that will serve all the surrounding communities in which M&J Bus has a contract. Um, in addition, they will have buses on site and vans on site, which will um, be available in, to use and to dispatch in case there's a breakdown, in case there's inadequate buses at a particular location. But generally, the main purpose of this facility is maintenance. Uh, with respect to the vans, because of the unique nature of the vans, typically as special needs children, the vans will be more frequently dispatched from the site because of the uneven hours of the van's usage and the inability to keep enough vans in any one particular location. So typically the vans would be dispatched from this site. If you look at the interior of the building, one of the main features that strikes you immediately is the fact that it has three large bays, which is suitable for bus repair, and, a, and a, one smaller one, which is suitable for the van. So it has a perfect physical setup within the building for the proposed use. There's also ample parking, as you will see, for, on the parking area for the buses, the support facilities, and the vans. And you'll see that we've shown approximately uh, 27 spaces for buses, although we don't expect really to have that many on site, uh, but it's possible depending on maintenance levels. We, we expect to have about 20 vans and the balance of the parking will be for support staff, uh, bus drivers and the like. And again, you'll see that specific um, design when Bob uh, reviews it with you. The wetland officer has also reviewed this application. In fact, he was on site with our engineer on Saturday. And he has determined that we do not need a new permit for this activity because we have limited the activity to the perimeter of the original site plan, which was approved in conjunction with the addition to the building uh, some, I don't know, 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, so there's no need for a new wetland permit. And there's also no need for administrative approval. Correct, correct. There's another factor I'd like you to consider as well to emphasize the fact that this is, is intended to be a maintenance facility. Normally when Mr. Beebe gets, gets a town contract, he tries to buy a facility or a, a location nearby he likes to own the facility because that way he has full control over it as opposed to a lease or something that uh, is temporary. Uh, in this instance, there is no town contract that's gonna be supported by this facility. Rather, this facility is gonna support the existing contracts in the surrounding areas and make it more efficient. Uh, he'll be able to get a vehicle repaired quick, quicker and get it back in service. Uh, in fact, in Columbia, it'd be ideal because it, he does have the Columbia contract and it'll be super service with respect to the Columbia needs uh, in terms of repairs and the like. In conjunction with this activity, there'll be full two, uh, two full-time mechanics on site as well as administrative staff, administrative person, I should add. That administration person will, administrative person rather, will be doing dispatching to some extent and also keeping the records of vehicle repairs which are needed uh, to be maintained for uh, DOT if for no other reason. Although this commission I'm sure knows the site history better than I do, uh, just to quickly review it, as I mentioned earlier, it was originally 
uh, a dealer for automobiles, including the, the full planopy of repairs, uh, body work, painting, and the like. Um, it, approximately 20 plus years ago, it became a different facility in conjunction with the addition. And um, it was creating trucks out of truck bodies and a frame and an engine and making different truck type vehicles uh, for sale. That activity terminated a, a month or two ago and the building mm -hmm. came on the market and uh, Mr. Beebe, of course, immediately saw it as an opportunity to provide better service to the locations in this general area, his locations in this general area. So he jumped on it and if for this commission to approve this application, we hope to close and purchase the property within 30 days. We've already done a lot of the base work with respect to this activity. So basically, as, as the building sits now, we're gonna walk into the building and employ it, employ a lot of the fixtures in the building which are, have been designed for this particular type of maintenance, which is very similar to the original constru construction of these trucks. There's a bunch of personal property that's also useful in our activity. So it's, it's really almost a turnkey operation. The only thing, as I mentioned earlier, that needs to be done is, is to rearrange the parking area so that it can support the use that we propose. And Mr. Fanner will go over that with you shortly. I've known Mr. Beebe for quite a few years. And one thing I know about him, he, he likes to own his own facilities. Um, he, he will do, he, and for a lot of reasons, he can provide better service. He knows that he has the same facility from year to year and, and he dictates what happens within the facility, not a, a, ten, a landlord or something else. This facility is important because it gives him the ability to control the maintenance in, in the area around Columbia where he has several uh, bus contracts. It allow him to give better service to these contracts and, and including Columbia, and he has control over the whole facility. Thank you. Is that, uh, one is that more everything you have? Yeah, one more comment uh, just, just to, um, for a point of information, I guess. School buses can be repaired by employees of a school bus company. You do not need a motor vehicle license to do this. Uh, the statute indicates that a quote, call of qualified mechanic may repair buses, but there's a specific statutory schedule for the maintenance of buses. And not only that, there is a, a routine inspection by DOT, DOT of all buses. So while this is allowed, there is also state supervision over this process of maintaining the buses. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bob Fanner if he wants to review the parking. Uh, yes, uh, Bob Fanner. Uh, I'm from J. Robert Fanner and Associates. We're located at 37 Grand Street in Niantic. Um, are we? Can we do Sheen's the screen shares on here to bring up the plan? Yes. Or yes, you can. Okay. I have the site plan ready. If you don't have it, so I do yeah, have the it ready. So. members received a PDF packet uh, with with the site plan and with the aerial photo with the overlay. Okay. That, that, that document. Perfect. Right. Can, everyone, can everyone see that? Share now? Got it. Yes. Got it. Okay. So this is uh, basically an overlay of the existing site plan that was done um, back when they converted from the dealership to the truck body uh, repair place. Um, and what we did is did a layout over the top of what was there to see if we could fit in the amount of parking that we need for the facility. Um, we have a few different parking areas. Um, you come in the entrance down at the bottom of the plan here. Um, we've put the van parking in this area in here. Um, right on. I like this. So this area, this area in here, and you see the green line is the van parking area. Um, we've got spots located along the road. Then we've got a few bus parking spaces in this area where we can double stack the buses, um, one behind the other, uh, which works in this kind of condition because again, it's not like a parking lot where you've got multiple people. Um, it's all controlled by us, so the stack parking works in that situation. Um, 
Then we have another parking area behind the building, um, back in this area here. This would be the employee parking, um, just for regular vehicles. And then we took a small corner of it and designated some bus parking. Um, we've got back-to-back -back car parking places, and two of those put together actually ends up doubling or it being one bus spot. Um, so it gives us a little flexibility if we need a little overflow for buses there. And also if we have more cars, they could become car parking places. Um, then we have a third parking area um, located on the side street, um, which is all bus parking uh, located in this area here. Um, and the only additional parking that we have is handicap parking um, for people that do need to access the building. There are two handicap spots located on the side of the building right next to the awning. Um, and the entrance there. So we do have two handicapped spots there to handle that. Um, all of the layout of the parking here falls within the um, approved limits of clearing from the previous site plan. Um, we pulled everything back a little bit. They kind of, over the years, the previous owner kind of expanded somewhat, um, but we've kept everything inside of their approved uh, area from the previous site plan um, without deviating outside of that area. So we're not creating any more disturbance. Um, there's a paved portion around the building, but the majority of the parking is actually a gravel parking area. Um, so there's not really any work to be done, so to speak, to create these parking areas. Um, again, they're, they're all, it's all gravel, it's all cleared now, there's nothing there. Um, so it's just kind of a matter of reimagining where everything's gonna go and once the buses and everything start parking in there, it'll create those, those areas. Um, there's, there's no park, there's a few parking places located on the paving in the front. Um, those parking places could be striped there to kind of establish that area. But again, the majority of the parking is located on the paving and all within the areas of um, the previous approval. Um, I will note um, the plan that we have, I have up there now is the site plan and then the second sheet that was submitted um, was simply an overlay with an image from Google Earth as the background, um, but it's the same layout each one just to kind of show you how it looked with the previous owner versus where we are now. Right. And that's yep. all I have. If anybody has any questions, I would be glad to address anything you might have. Uh, Bob, can you pop up the uh, aerial one? Uh, yeah. Um, Looks like you have it as a tab right there. Yeah, I got to stop the share to switch, I think. So I'll just do a oh. reshare. <laughs> it wouldn't let me click. There we go. So this is the Google Earth image in the background. Yes. So you can kind of see in some of the areas, you know, they had some parking over in this area before. Um, they had some parking back here that we're not, we're, again, we're not utilizing those areas. So those were outside of their approved area. Um, and you can see they even expanded a little bit on the side street there. Again, they put back outside of the approved limits, so to speak. So we've kept everything inside there so we can uh, maintain the original um, approval. So while we have this up, one of the things that I wanted to point out is if you look on the, the uh, back side of the property, it's actually about 240 feet uh, from the the proposed parking, uh, extend of the proposed parking area all the way back to the uh, um, property line. It's about 240 feet that we're in, in a, we're in a uh, flood zone, flood zone A, this whole part of our town is flood zone A. We have a wetland as you can see a pond on the left and it's up against uh, between the 10 mile river and the Willimantic river. Um, so that's, which is why we're concerned with wetlands and why um, uh, John Valenti, the wetlands agent was involved to a certain extent in terms of review. But if you'll notice that just behind the, uh, the upper portion of the image beyond the parking areas, um, the previous owners, and I don't know if that it was Mr. Rose or the other people uh, that came in, he leased it to, for a year or two to someone else for the same job, same uh, business. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, slippage of uh, where things were stored. Um, and it's, that's something that uh, Attorney Harris and I've talked about and how um, one of the things that we need to be very careful with because it is wetlands uh, is that 
um, any storage of anything not be beyond the approved parking area. And we certainly have no objection to that. There's, um, if you do need to expand the parking, um, and again, Attorney Harris and I talked about this, uh, if, if the parking does need to expand for a reason, um, it would take a wetlands application and, the, and the, the commission, the wetlands commission would take a look at, at how the parking could expand. Um, I don't know that, it, depending on how much of an expansion, whether or not you would need to come back to PCC afterwards or, 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 or not. But um, so there is, expansion is possible, but it would have to go through Inland Wetlands Commission, expansion of the paving. Okay. Um, and one more thing. One of the things that um, the uh, commission, I think it was in 1997, asked for um, was having, um, there were some street trees between uh, Route 66 East and the property line, just enough street trees to soften the fact that it's um, a, um, equipment at that time, it was trucks, uh, uh, mostly uh, highway department trucks parked in the back and same along Commerce Drive. And I think it would be good for those uh, to remain because um, we'd be able to have um, a little bit of screening there, not so much, and there certainly isn't now, and, and I'm not suggesting there'd be enough screening that there was so much screening that there'd be a, a problem with vandalism or anything like that. But just to, to uh, let the driver's eye rest on a, on a tree instead of um, an orange parking lot or a yellow parking lot <laughs> with, with buses there. <laughs> Okay, should we take down that uh, slide yes. or the, yes. that, that PDF? Yes, you can stop sharing now. Thank you. Um, Thank and you. I, I have uh, talked to um, the wetlands agent, although not today. The last time I talked to him was on Thursday. And he, he did want to follow up on a stormwater system that he thought was not functioning. And I've not heard back from him that he was satisfied with it. I don't think it's an issue but I think it's something that can be taken just as a, an item in the, uh, uh, any sort of a motion that the commission might wanna make, um, just that uh, he needs to, to uh, confirm that it's uh, functioning to his satisfaction. Okay. One thing. Uh, question, Paula, do we have any uh, engineering drawings done other than the two that were presented tonight? No. We have old ones in the file from the uh, the '60s uh, yeah. and the uh, in the late '90s. So there's no existing conditions drawing. Um, th it hasn't changed from what the 1997 layout. So the qu but my question is: Is there no existing site plan submitted as part of this application? The site plan that you saw tonight is what was submitted because there's been no change to the existing site plan. So it, it indicates what is paved and what is not paved? Yes. Okay. So you're talking yes. about some drain you're talking about some drainage issues right now? I don't think there are drainage issues. We just I've not for the, for our files we've not seen the we've not got a, um, a confirmation from town staff that it's been addressed. Don't, don't we require as part of the application an existing site plan, A2 survey, whatever? This is an A2 survey. Nothing has changed. And what's the date of that survey? 97. Okay. So nothing has changed? Nothing has changed. The building is exactly the same. The signage is the same. The area of pavement. And the, area and the, si and the, site, and the site conditions are the same. They have not yes. changed. That's been verified? There Yes. By whom? John Valenti and myself. Okay. Uh, question, how many, how many employee parking, lot, parking spaces are there on the plan? 39. And how many handicapped spaces are provided? Two, because there are only two. It's not for, there's no customers that are coming there. And that, that, that would have to not, be. That, that, that is not the point. There could be handicapped employees. The state yes. statute states yes. that you have to provide a certain the, amount of handicapped spaces yes. for yes. each. All right. Yes. The, so we're, meet, the we're building, meeting that, we're meeting that building, requirement. 
the building inspector will make sure that that is met. But that's part of the site plan approval process. So how do we deal with that? Mr. Fanner, do you have an answer to that? You're the engineer in terms of uh, parking requirements. I don't yes, have. We did. We did provide two handicap spots, which are more than what is required for the number of parking places that we have. Typically, a ratio of parking places of um, regular car parking places to handicap spots. Um, less than 100 is usually only requires one. Um, so we have two in this case. Okay. Good. Is there, Mr. Fanner, is there a separate requirement for employee parking that would be categorized separately? I'm not familiar with the regulations. No, no, because all the parking places, you know, the, the parking calculation to come up with the, the final number is used, whether it's uh, employees or customers or whatever you want to say. Yeah, it's you, really you, based on the number of spots. Yeah, usually it's about 5% of the total par parking spaces. So that's a different number, Bob, what you're saying than what Mr. Fanner no, said. No, if they have 30, if, we're, if they have 37 spaces, then uh, that would be two handicapped spaces. So okay. So it's about 5% five, 5 of the total. That's meeting the 5%, but not the 100 yeah. to 1 ratio that Mr. Fanner right, exactly. mentioned. Okay. So they're, right. they're erring in the, on the safe side. Okay. Um, any questions from the commission on this? Can I make one comment? Um, Bob, you did talk with the wetlands agent about the uh, drainage system, did you not? Yes, I actually met with them on the site um, and we did um, review the drainage out there. Um, there was at one time um, some problem with the drainage system, but that had been actually cleaned out, pumped out, um, and functioning properly again. Um, so there was no issues with the drainage. Um, again, there was, there was a catch basin in the back. Um, that had silted in and they had that cleaned out and that um, alleviated the problem. So I, I know when I spoke with them on the site, because um, we had talked about if we had to do some new drainage work because the system was failing, that would require a permit and, um, from him. But after reviewing the site, and he also, I believe, spoke to the owner, um, as well as um, our buyer and they both discussed it in length. Um, and he was satisfied that they were repaired and functioning properly um, to meet his, his requirements for the drainage for the site. Okay. Uh, uh, any questions from the commission, from the applicant, of the applicant? I have a question. The area that's beyond the parking that was not to be built on or stored, I should say, has there been any move to clean that up? Is there trailers or is it debris, all that stuff? To... I can answer that one, Alex. The, the, the existing owner, um, current owner, um, has cleaned it up. That it's spotless there. I didn't see a scrap of paper. Of course, there was a little snow on the ground, but I didn't see a scrap of paper anywhere, so, let alone a, an engine or a, a shed or anything. It's the... Uh, the aerial is the way it was probably a year or two ago, or at least a yeah, year ago. I, yeah, I was out there and I have to say, I, I, was, I was very surprised how clean it was considering how much stuff was there. Uh, there literally is nothing back there. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing anywhere on the property that I saw. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions or comments from the commission? I think it's a no. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually happy to see it's getting used so quick and not sitting empty. I am too. I want to say to Mr. Beebe, thank you for bringing your business to town. I, we appreciate that. Um, just a couple questions. Um, I, I have a, a minor concern, and I don't know that we even have the authority to raise it during a site plan review, and I'm going to be very candid about that. So. Don't take this as a formal uh, observation, but maybe a casual one. Uh, I'm hoping where possible, we can avoid a sea of big yellow buses right on the street, especially on Commerce Drive. Uh, and it, it's pure aesthetics. Um, it, that's part of what we do as a zoning commission. But as part of a site plan review, there's probably 
not a lot of authority to exercise any control. And I don't even think we we're attempting to exercise that control because I see that large area of bus parking. And I, I think of those big bus depots I drive by on Route 95 in North Haven. And it makes me cringe a little bit. And I, uh, a little bit concerned about that. I don't get the impression it's going to be full of buses because it's not a depot, it's just a repair facility. So I, I am assuming the buses will be coming here as needed and in and off the property and they're not going to be considered uh, housed there. Uh, but I do have a, and so that's more of an observation. I'm not even asking for a reaction to that from the applicants. Uh, the, but separate from that, the, the property purchase has it triggered the Connecticut Transfer Act because it was once used as an auto body? Uh, I'm sure auto body was a repair was done at the site when it was an auto dealership. I can answer that. Um, the law has changed a little bit. Um, it was unclear, but it, it, it gets a little detailed. There was a form one filed in a transaction between the car dealer and the truck assembly facility. The law also changed in the interim where just painting, uh, auto painting or vehicle painting is no longer a factor that determines whether or not it's a, an establishment. So the bottom, we're, we're still looking at that issue, but the bottom line, we believe it is not an establishment at this point in time because the auto body use terminated and the law changed and just auto painting is not a, a use that generate that dictates it to be an establishment. Let me just illuminate uh, the rest of the the members. I, if in case you're not familiar, under Connecticut's uh, statutes, uh, when you transfer a property that was one of three uh, critical uses in its history, uh, it may trigger the need to go through a very involved environmental investigation and certification process, one of those being auto body, use as an auto body shop. So that form one, I believe, I'm not that expert in, in that area, that's probably um, at a different point in time, the requirements may have been different and they may change in the future. Uh, but I, I was just kind of curious because it, it segued into my next question, what level of environmental investigation has the buyer done as part of the potential purchase of the property? Phase one, phase two? There was a phase one and phase two completed. Um, okay. there, was, there was a significant environmental testing done uh, probably 20 years ago now. There still were monitoring wells available, so they, some of them were still available. They checked those wells. Anyway, bottom line, the report was about as clean as I could ever see an environmental report. The only question that was left up in the air was whether or not it was an establishment. And the more I've looked at it, the less I believe it is. And the monitoring wells, do they cover the bulk of the area around the building or do they go throughout the property? They were throughout the property. The ones that were remaining that they could find, uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure exactly where they work. Uh, I didn't, I read the report, but I didn't look at the mapping. Okay. Okay. I, so you're comfortable environmentally, Mr. Beebe is comfortable environmentally proceeding with the purchase? Mike? Yeah, the, 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 I was posing that as a question. I think he, he is um, at this point in time. Yeah, he's okay. not Mr. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've talked with him about it. Uh, we're still, I'm still going to review this issue once more before we close. If there's any issues that surface, I, I would beg you to bring that to the immediate attention of our town planner. We like to know what's going on where, and it's only uh, during a transfer of property and a review like this that we get a good snapshot from a town perspective into those issues if they exist. So we would love to know wh what, what's going on. Please keep her in the loop on that. Rick, Rick question, question on that, if in fact, we do approve this site plan, should it be a condition of approval that the environmental um, assessment is done or that it is a clean environmental assessment? I don't, I don't think we have that in our regulations to mandate that. And that's really a whole separate um, 
reign of authority that's on many levels above us in some respects. I don't think we need to address that formally. I just wanted to get a good feel for the property personally. Well, I can tell you, I've read a lot of environmental reports and this one is about as clean as I've, I've seen, honestly, especially for a facility of this nature. Ed, and I said, you? that's a different issue from whether or not it may be an establishment, but, but even if it's an establishment, based on the, the, this report, um, there is Mr. No Harris, I, just, just to interject, just, I don't think that uh, probably many members of the commission understand what you mean by an establishment. That's one, if it's one of the three categories that are considered that trigger this environmental, uh, the Transfer Act, that's considered an establishment. Right. So, right. you know, the, the other verbiage we could use, if it's one of the three uh, uh, categories of properties that would trigger a very intensive uh, process for the, for the transfer of the property. So establishment is, that's what that term means. But there's different levels as well in terms of the process. There's it's a one, two, and a three. Um, and in this case, at worst, assuming you we had to file a form one, that would be it. And that, that form one, all, all it has to be supported with is an, a phase one and a phase two environmental study, which has been accomplished. And we just got the results in the last two weeks. Okay, thank you. That's, up, that's the extent of my questions about that. Any other questions from the commission? Nope, I'm good. Yeah, this isn't a public hearing, so we won't be opening this up to, to any questions potentially from the public. Uh, so that being said, uh, Paula, what's your recommendation? I'm co very comfortable with this application. I think it's very well done and I don't, there's no, no lingering questions from my perspective. I concur. My only lingering, and it's only because I don't have it, uh, from the wetlands agent's mouth um, is just the, the fact that we, I need to, to see that the stormwater uh, system has been taken care of, uh, which you can handle that as part of your motion. <coughs> it's not gonna hold anything up. Uh, well, we, is there a reason to put it in our motion if they have their own regulatory authority? <coughs> I mean, to put, to put it in our motion if there's a separate area of of, of um, oversight, is that necessary? I, I would- I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I, perhaps not. Perhaps not. I think yeah, it's okay to not, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't, just don't see we need to do that. We okay. have a, a, a separate system for that. Um, uh, Paula did send me a sample motion. I don't know if that it went out to everyone else. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna read it, but this is not making the motion. I wanna, uh, at this point, I would uh, suggest that we consider um, taking action to approve the, the application. And I'm gonna read this out loud for everybody. And if you, there's no objection, then it, that, that will be the motion. Uh, the, the motion. Uh, motion to approve the application of M&J bus. I, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to um, go past this. Is everyone comfortable moving forward to a motion to approve? Yes. yes. I, I read it already and I approve it too. Okay, uh, make a motion to approve the application of M&J Bus Incorporated for a school bus service facility per the application submitted, the conceptual parking lot layout dated 11-21-2020 and statements made by the applicant and the applicant's agent with the following conditions. Outdoor parking is only permitted per the conceptual parking layout any outdoor storage shall meet section 66.3 and is limited to the area defined by the approved conceptual parking layout. The site stormwater system shall be in working order and confirmed by Columbia's wetland agent and the existing screening provided by the street trees shall be maintained with trees replaced as needed. So that motion was made with that uh, verbiage in it, Paula suggested. Let's just leave it at that. So I would make them motion as presented. <coughs> Put a second. Second, second that. that. That was rich. Uh, is there any discussion amongst members of the commission? Uh, yes, I, I have a couple of comments. Uh, sure. One, I, I, I think I have an issue with the word conceptual site plan. 
because it doesn't mean proposed site plan. Conceptual will allow some flexibility in the future. Um, the site plan, I, I believe our requirements require a site plan that has at least some dimensions on it that show proposed sizes of parking spaces, proposed aisles of, trans, uh, of, of vehicular, tra uh, vehicular transportation, et cetera. Um, the word conceptual really bothers me in this application. I think a proposed site plan would hold their feet to the fire with what is going to be proposed and what will be actually done on the site. Uh, again, conceptual in my mind, and I'm not sure legally, allows them a lot more flexibility than I think we want to give them. The, um, the, the what was submitted is to scale, so it can be me measured off very easily. And the name, no. the name printed on the plan is called conceptual parking layout. So I'm quoting what was on what they submitted. Right, and that and that Paul is what I have a problem with. If it's a proposed layout, that's different than a conceptual layout. Also, we do not scale drawings. We have dimensions on drawings. Because as you know, when we transpose those to an electronic media or whatever, you can't scale a drawing. You do not scale drawings. You need dimensions on drawings. I have a solution to that because I think your comment's very on point, Bob. Uh, so that we could change the verbiage in each reference to the layout. Uh, uh, for example, I'm gonna change, I'm, I'm gonna withdraw the motion if you don't mind, because I think revising the verbiage would be helpful. Uh, uh, the second person who seconded, Rich, you're okay with that? Yep, yep I'm okay um, with that. So what if we came up with, I'm gonna read the first line of a changed uh, uh, motion. A uh, motion to approve the application of M&J busing for a school bus service facility per the application submitted. The proposed layout labeled, quote, conceptual parking layout, unquote. So conceptual will simply be a label for a document, not that it is in fact conceptual if we use that terminology. Bob, does that make you more comfortable? I, I, think we're, I think we're trying to get around the fact that it says conceptual on the plan. Maybe the plan is resubmitted and it says proposed site plan. Well, we're, we would call it a proposed layout and we well, would we just say call the anything. title of it was it, wait conceptual. A wait a minute, Rick, we can't call it anything. The, the engineer submitting the plan has to call it something. He has called it conceptual at this point. If he changes it to propose, then we can vote on it. We can't change the title of someone else's drawing, Rick. I didn't suggest that we change the title, that we just are referring to it as a proposed plan and, that, and say that they use the title conceptual but we're treating it as a proposed plan. I think that that addresses what your concern is. Um, Please don't misunderstand me. I, I'm fully in agreement with this, this proposal. I'm just worried about the legal ramifications of, of referring to a conceptual plan. One of okay. Things, one of the things to consider is this is a different use. There aren't gonna be customers pulling in looking for a place to park. It's gonna be, their own buses, the people that drive their buses, the mechanics most likely are going to be driving to wherever the bus is currently, driving yeah, it here and Paula, parking it. Paul, let's not go down that path. Okay, if all we right. Could. Let, let's go down the path um, saying that I respect Bob's concern about the word conceptual. And um, maybe we can simply get the applicant to agree to resubmit this with conceptual change to proposed and um, approve it subject to that change being submitted. Would that be re something that makes you comfortable, Bob? Because your, your concerns, I think, are, are valid. Uh, you know, we might as well erase that as an issue. I can't imagine that's going to be an issue for the applicant. Um, who would I ask, address that question to, Mr. Harris? Why don't you direct it to Bob, but I don't think we have any issue with that at all. You know, I... I I can certainly change the title to be a proposed site plan or just site plan. Okay. Okay. I would feel uh, I, that's great. I, I would really feel much better about that. Okay. And I think we, we can we can approve it can, on that condition. We can approve it okay. on that condition.
let me take my changes out of the, the draft that I have. Uh, Uh, Paula, can you help me wordsmith here? Because I'd like to get this approved tonight. Um, I'm looking at it in a Word document. I can make some changes so I can actually read it as, as we want it. Um, How about if we just say the... the um, for, I think we need to refer to what was being submitted, which is good. Yeah, can't, can't you just amend the proposal and add a line at the bottom? Yes, that's what I was thinking of doing. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking the same. In, where you've got the stormwater, take that section out and put in um, that the applicant will, will submit um, uh, the uh, parking layout as a site plan or Bob can come up with a language that he's comfortable with on that. Yeah, Bob, help us out here, because I'd like to get this done for them tonight. Yeah, we can just, we'll, we'll call it a site plan. Instead of being conceptual parking layout, we'll call it a site plan layout for M&J bus. Yep, uh, you know, that would be fine, that would be fine. So we actually, did. the title, the title will, will read M&J bus, Inc, site plan, parking layout. Does that work? Yep. Yeah, yep. then you just make amendment to the original proposal to what he exactly said and both those go to vote. Somebody needs to make an amendment uh, proposal. Yeah, amend the it, original it with proposal me a second. And we accept it as that and then it goes. I, I'm going to make the changes and then read it out loud. I think you're supposed and, to just amend the proposal and then they both get voted on as amended. I think, I think Rick, Rick, Rick withdrew his proposal. I withdrew my proposal. So it's all new. It's all yes. new. Start, start from let, scratch. Let me read out loud how this would read because I think that'll be easier for everybody to consider. Uh, uh, motion to approve the application of M&J Bus Incorporated for a school bus service facility per the application submitted. The M&J uh, site plan layout dated 1121 and statements made by the applicant and the applicant's agent were the following conditions. Outdoor parking is per the M&J site plan layout. Any outdoor storage shall meet section 66.3 and is limited to the areas defined by the approved M&J site plan layout confirmed by Columbia's wetland agent and the existing screening provided by the street trees shall be maintained with trees, re, uh, trees replaced as needed. And uh, simply calling it a site plan layout, uh, re regardless of what they put as a label on it, I think addresses your concerns, Bob, correct? Yes, it does. Okay. So that was a motion that. just made. I'll second I need it. a second. I'll second Any it. discussion? That's it. All those in favor, please raise your hand, members. This works like a charm, the, the raising the hand. Oh, that's a unanimous yes. Alex, were you in favor of this? Yes, I was. Okay, thank you. So that's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for the application. Thank you, uh, thank you. Thank you Mr. Beebe, for bringing your business to town. And I th think you did a wonderful job presenting Mr. Harris and Mr. Flanner. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, guys. Paula. I, I have this, um, I did this as a change word document. I'll email it to you after the meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, item 7.2, election of officers. Uh, is anyone else interested in being chair? Because we should keep it open. I mean, I would love to continue. Pardon I'm nominating me? Bob. Okay. No joking. <laughs> no no joking. way. No way. <laughs> who, who wants to do what? I don't. I don't want you to feel. I mean, I love doing this. I love working with all of you. But if anyone else has an interest, I. I, I don't. Nothing should be a foregone conclusion. Uh, you thank know, you it's, it's Rick Nassif. Well, thank you. It's a an easy job to do. We we've had excellent support, Paula. Thank you for all the support from you. Don't um, forget Flo. I yeah. I was gonna get there. <laughs> Flo, it, you're the other vital. You know, to go through 
um, minute after minute after minute and not have to modify them, thank you. I, I love you for that. Um, then I would make a motion that we renominate the current slate as it, it exists. That would be Vera as uh, vice, chair. Uh, vice chair, myself as chair, and Bob, you're the secretary formally? Yep. Okay. Do I have a second to that? I'll second. second. Any discussion? <laughs> no discussion? Nope, all well done. Okay. All those in favor? That's a unanimous vote. Thank you, everybody. Um, that said, next up, uh, regulation revisions, discussion of possible revisions to section 24, 21.4 of the Lake uh, Columbia Lake Watershed Protection. Uh, Dan, you're here. Please unmute yourself. We would want you to participate. Hello. Welcome, Dan. How are you? Dan O'Neill, for the record, representing uh, Lake Management Committee. So where are we on this, Paula? Bring me up to speed. Um, Lake Management met a few weeks ago, and Dan, I know, has a couple things he can report on that. Um, what I sent out to you in the packet was the same document that um, I developed uh, two years ago. Um, however, it's it includes the... Um, changes that Henry Beck had, had suggested, um, so that his changes are in red, my comments are in blue. Um, and Henry Beck was representing LMAC, not doing it as, a, as the town attorney. Um, so just a few changes that, that he suggested, most of which I agree with, a couple I don't. Um, one of which Dan and I talked about it and he concurred. Um, but I don't know how far you want to get into this tonight. Rick. Uh, why don't you present everything you have? Uh, we'll keep it reasonable. You know. Okay. We'll do what we need. Um, I can pull it up on the screen if that would help. I can share. It would my help. Screen. Okay. So we know what you're referencing each step of the way. And, and, and members, you can bring up the same document if you have a computer in front of you. I printed it. Come here. I was having some problems downloading them, so. Okay, yeah, yeah. so bring it up on the screen, Paula. That's perfect. I'm Thank trying. You. All right. Whew. Shouldn't have taken this long. I don't know. All right. There we go. So this is the same document and it's, we talked about it last time in terms of what is changing and most of it, there's a few policy changes, but most of it is just reorganizing it. And um, my goal was to make it a little bit more user friendly, although Dan found a section that may not be so user friendly. Um, the one of the changes that um, Henry Beck inserted uh, was in the applicability, which is uh, one of the things our current regs don't make it really clear, but it's um, the first section of this is, uh, I think lays it out pretty well, and Dan incur occur uh, concurred, is mm -hmm. within the Columbia Lake watershed protection area, these regulations shall apply to all new structures, additions to existing structures, and expansion of non-permeable ground surfaces. Um, and then we go on to say, and it's because we had this in the, the previous um, regulations, says, or any activity that requires a planning and zoning, zoning board of appeals, inland, and Henry added in the wetlands or zoning compliance certificate. Um, and then, then these requirements shall be in addition to the zoning requirements of the underlying uh, residential agriculture district. Um, the inland wetlands, you don't want the inland wetlands to be reviewing, uh, to be applicable because they review everything that might be somebody just repairing a deck or putting up a, um, a wall, which uh, wetlands will take care of whether or not that's um, uh, something that they need to address. And it really shouldn't be triggering the, the phosphorus runoff. 
it's an existing wall or even a new wall. It's um, maybe a new wall, but not a deck that's over the, over the water. So I think wetlands should not be in there. And Dan suggested, why would planning and zoning in ZBA? Um, ZBA would be going if they're looking to expand a building, say, well, once they're expanding a building, it's, it's triggered. So we may not need this whole section here. And I think the regs as they exist now don't have any of those specific references to- It does, um, it does have the planning and zoning and board of appeals. Oh, it does? Okay. Yeah, it's just not, it's not under applicability, but it's somewhere else, but it is uh, in there. I gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> um, pa Paula, just to uh, interject, I'm um, head of the subcommittee that reviews docks, seawalls, and rafts and moorings. Yes. Uh, Steve Harrington and I are on that subcommittee. Um, our purview basically is the seawall out to the lake. Um, from the inside the seawall is the in, the in the Wetlands Commission and okay. whomever, whoever else. Um, so we make recommendations to the Board of Selectmen for approval or denial of applications for improvements or rebuilds of walls, um, repairs or new docks, and uh, rafts and moorings. That's that's the way we've been doing it. Again, we don't have any um, standing for approval, but we do make recommend recommendations to the Board of Selectmen for approval of those items. Right, right. And if um, if it's something that needs a building permit, then it comes down through the, the planning and uh, through the land use department, and, and we might pick it up at that point. If it is something that's affecting the surface of the property, but not, not adding a deck or just rebuilding the, the stone wall in the same area. And wetlands may be, be there because somebody has done something on a piece of property that affects wetlands that has nothing to do with surface changes. That's correct. That's so correct. They, should, they shouldn't have to, if, if wetlands um, uh, gets involved, it, you know, if wetland gets involved because somebody's going to build something, well, we're, that's covered. But if yes. it's wetlands because there's a wetlands issue, then they shouldn't be needing to do a, a spreadsheet and uh, uh, meet the phosphorus levels and all that stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Those are my those are my two two cents on that section. Yeah. No, I, I agree, Paula. That's right. Okay. I think that I agree with those thoughts. Um, one minor um, wordsmithing item. Under 21.4.4, under the note at the end. Well, the note is I'm, just me, me writing to you two years okay. ago. Oh, okay. Because when you say existing runoff, I would always want to make sure we describe it as phosphorus runoff. Right, right. Because yeah, it, I wouldn't want runoff in the regulation to be construed to be water runoff. Right, right. No, I, it, that, that was just a note. Okay. Um, so. Okay. Um, uh, where I'd like to get to this evening, let's we'll get through the regulations on, and any comments from Dan, but I, I definitely don't want to take any, um, form any perspectives as a commission this oh, evening. No, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. That would be premature. Uh, so again, the red is what, what um, Henry has inserted and it's, it reads better with, with his uh, changes in here. Um, I was just continuing on some, some of his changes. Um, he had quite a few changes in our exception area, um, the one time. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, uh, Dan, while we're on this topic, do you wanna talk about um, the discussion you had with LMAC on yep. um, banking yep. and, and multiple changes? Yep. Um, and just to let you know, we had a, a kind of an abbreviated LMAC meeting. Well, it was a long meeting, but our normal stuff was a little abbreviated. We started off with an hour long uh, Zoom. We uh, joined a presentation on some lake type stuff that someone else is doing. And then we actually uh, had a hiccup with our minutes from the previous meeting. So we couldn't take any official actions on anything this particular meeting anyways. I basically gave him a quick one rundown about what we had talked about at the last P and Z meeting. 
uh, fill them in that this was, was back on the table again, uh, refreshed everybody's memory, um, told them that two ideas that were being kicked around were the, was the, uh, um, the banking of uh, surface improvements. Uh, and that's something we had actually discussed back then as well. Everyone, generally speaking, was in favor of some type of banking of improvements, um, like we talked about before. And then I told them, you know, maybe the idea of our one-time small impervious area with 100% mitigation concept, um, the idea was floated to maybe able to do that more than one time. Um, just the concept, not how many times, not how often or anything like that. And I think the general feeling was that uh, that was not a good idea just because they didn't want an accumulative effect over the uh, over the years. Okay, anything else? Um, that's pretty much it. I told them that, um, you know, this was ongoing here that I would be, you know, be at this meeting and at our next LMAC meeting, I'll have a much more detailed discussion uh, and I'll and I'll pass around these um, uh, revised regs for them to draft reg to look at uh, for them to look at. Paul and I are discussing a few other things on there as well that we're going to try and iron out. And so uh, next time we'll have a, a, a more in depth discussion at LMAC. Thank you. You know when it comes to lake issues, like the the nutrient allocation plan initially, even though it was a zoning action. It was really a product of LMAC. Yeah, those guys did a great job. How long ago was that? 30 years ago? Oh, three. 2000. Oh, yeah, right? I mean, uh, the lake plan itself. It was know. a lot of study that went on for a long yeah, time prior time to before that. Yeah, in the 80s. Yeah. I know these were first adopted in, in 03. So. Okay. It seems like longer ago, but um, it's, it's already had a beneficial effect on the lake. And it, it uh, from just overhearing uh, either John or, or uh, Connie talk to people when they need to do this, I've not heard anybody say, why do I have to do this? This is outrageous. They're all like, oh, the lake is beautiful. This will help the lake. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because usually people are, are against something like this. But uh, they they value the lake. Yes, yeah, nice. great part of the lake. So um, Henry made a lot of editing changes in here, which we don't need to go through. But one of the things I did want to talk about um, when we were developing this, um, I was pretty much working with with John, uh, some with with Dan. Uh, Dan was I pulled him in a little bit late would probably been easier if I'd had him in earlier, but I didn't. Um, but the, um, um, and with uh, Connie, who's been administering it, the zoning agent. Um, in the self mitigation, one of the things that, that um, John was suggesting is if um, we had the requirement is, uh, yes, you can do this one time um, and you have to do it at least uh, be able to handle a, a two inch of rainfall, which is more than what we ask for in other areas of the regulation. Um, and John's feeling was um, they're just doing it once, it'll catch that building. Uh, it, we were, the example that we were always using around the table was a shed, um, but they'd put a, you know, a, a, a um, I think it was 18 inch wide trench with two inches to be able to to treat two inches of rainwater um, i'd leave the specifics to the our, our you know our, okay. our professional staff to establish okay, okay. you know what the specifics i i just want targets uh yeah. i i don't know how everyone yeah. else feels yeah. i i just wanted to point out that henry was thought it it should be one inch which that is what we've done in the past but but uh our expert our resident expert um had, had Felt that two inches was more appropriate. Yeah, getting getting to about what Rick was talking about, it does specifically say 12 inches by 18 inches, but maybe there should be a comment in there that 
says it may vary or something like that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I don't want to get locked in or constrained or even mandate an unnecessary item. I'd rather have a, a, a target for what we want to accomplish. And then, you know, if we have to have to separately approve, you know, what the working regulations are. The only um, concern I have, and I'm gonna to go to a different area. Uh, um, prior to, we, we had a, a, a town zoning enforcement agent that would constantly insist that people in the watershed uh, do mulch beds as opposed to other methods of, she was very specific about what she, what she wanted um, to um, meet the, the, the best management practices. And I, I would rather leave that to a homeowner to come up with. I just want something empirical that they can meet as a, as a goal. And that's, that's the way it is, is handled now. And the spreadsheet is far more user-friendly um, at this point where you can and next at our next meeting we can I'll put it up on the screen and we can I'll show you but once you find that you need to change your surfaces there's a portion of the spreadsheet that you say well if I took a thousand square feet of this of lawn and made it mulch bed what would that do oh that's not enough I need 2,000 so you can play around with it um, and with different alternatives, I think there's six or seven different, actually there's more alternatives because it's lawn to woodland or lawn to this or putting in a um, BMP um, to uh, uh, a dry well to, to handle the you know, roof runoff. So the, the homeowner can figure it out a little bit better than they could have in the past. Okay. And, I, and I know who you're speaking of and I'm not sure why it was done that way, but. Okay. I'd like to go back, if I could, to one, one of the comments that you made, Dan, about the LMAC having the perspective that they would rather limit it to a one-time one allowance for the small changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, could you just explain the perspective on that? Because I don't have that same perspective, and I'll explain how I feel about it, but I really want to know in detail who, who felt what way, not, not the individual names but just give me a just give me a better feel for that well the point as i understand it the point of the whole nutrient allocation plan is to um make sure we don't add more phosphorus to the lake uh, based on changes to properties uh, there's a target value that would be uh, the best for the lake for each individual parcel based on their size and surface area um, and there's a lot of those parcels that are already in excess of what that target is for the health of the lake. So, but the recognition is that we, you can't put the burden on a, on a homeowner to bring a property all the way down phosphorus wise to what's best for the lake. So what was established at the beginning was that a, at least a 10% reduction would get everybody incrementally closer. Um, and so that process is put in place, but it can be a lot of work. It can be expensive. It can be, you might have to hire an engineer to work with you to figure something out. And the recognition was that for, for small uh, changes that maybe that was too onerous. So they said, all right, well, let's allow for those types of things without having to go through the process, without having to uh, make your property 10% bigger. So if you might want to go put a little shed in and then all of a sudden you've got to account for, I don't know, say, be, say four sheds worth of phosphorus just because to get that 10% reduction. And that seemed like too much. So as long as you could leave your property as it is, uh, phosphorus wise, then you could have that small addition. Um, but if you say you build a shed one year and then the next Next year you expand the patio and the next year you put a uh, you know a, a roof over your front steps or something like that now you've gotten into a more uh, you know a larger increase in the uh, amount of phosphorus 
and you and you may be mitigating it each time you go to hold yourself level but you ne the lake never gets the benefit of the 10 improve uh, 10 percent improvement to that property so conceptually I, I remember when we enacted the regulations the idea was to give people who were doing a major redo of their property an incentive to at least reduce by 10 percent the amount of phosphorus currently flowing off the property. But I think the idea with the incremental improvements are people like to make changes to their property on an ongoing basis. So how do we let them do small changes without those small changes being cumulative large changes? So if it was a large change, they'd have to go back to the nutrient allocation plan. And if they were to make multiple small changes to a property and uh, come up with a plan to add 10 feet of 10 by 10 of patio, and then 10 more, another 10 by 10, then 10 by 10. And all of a sudden, there's 600 more square feet of patio adjacent to the lake. Well, the, the, and I, I get the idea that a one time thing would preclude that, but um, on the same, and we don't want to enable a large expansion of the property that would be negatively impact the lake. But if we allow these smaller improvements, once every two years or three years, for example, and that just can't, popped into my head. And I don't know that that would bear analysis. And each time there can be absolutely no increase in the nutrient runoff based on a cursory incremental analysis that was not formalized. I think we can um, say that the big, big things are gonna be able to be accomplished uh, with, with a reduction and then some time-spaced, um, small, small improvements, not one time, but multiple. You, you want to add, add a, a, a stoop in front of some stairs, a, a, a door, or, you know, I, I, there's multiple small things that people want to do. They want to put a, put a pad out for a generator or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. The ability to make those changes as they need to without it being burdensome, but on the same token, maybe they do have to space them out if they're going to get a, they're not getting a free pass. They're just going to have to 100% mitigate what they're doing. Yeah. And I understand that. That's, you know, it's not a, I'm not saying that the committee as a whole said, no, we're not interested in that at all. It was the initial knee jerk reaction was like, geez, you know, we kind of, kind of thought we were doing something helpful with this one time thing. Um, so I don't think they're, adverse to discussing it or exploring that at all it kind of fits into the the banking as well so i mean for instance if you let's say you do a project now where you need to do a 10 percent um, reduction five years from now you might do another project and then you'd have to do another 10 percent reduction now, all of a sudden you've done 20 percent on a property and is that right you know and well and if you do is it, it especially if somebody came in and did a 15% reduction because they were trying to be environmentally conscious, do we want to penalize them if there's no way to get past that 15% at some point in the future? And that's really the, the, mind, the mindset I have at least. And I, I don't think that the rest of the commission differs in that respect. We're trying to say, look, if you've done pretty much everything you can in the first go round, how do we let you reasonably use your property on an ongoing basis? So yep. I don't know that we have an answer to that this evening. I just wanted to get those words out to everybody. Yeah, yep. And like I said, LMAC is more than happy to, to think about those things. I'll have some more Well, details, we don't want to but... take any action until we, I'm pretty much, um, you know, it's going to be in unison with LMAC and hopefully reach a consensus with you about what the best approach here is. Not that, that we formally have to do that, but I, you, that's just the way we want to, approach yep. this. At least I'm speaking for myself. I don't mean to speak for everyone else, but yeah, you know, we just value the input from LMAC so much that um, we, I, I hope you look at us as partners in this process. Yeah, well, absolutely. We're advisory committee, so we'll come up with our best advice and let people so know. So let's digest these changes as they're presented tonight in the them, and then let's further the discussion to the next meeting if everyone's good. Is there anything else anyone would like to bring up? Paul, you want to take down the, the document so we can I can see everyone's face. Hello, everybody.
Yeah, Hello. welcome back. <laughs> I, are you all on the same page as I am with what I said to Dan? Yeah. Does everyone have the same perspective? And if there's any other ideas, I want to bring them forth now. I think one, one, of, the, one of the concerns, I'm, I'm on LMAC as well as Dan, and one of the concerns we did have is uh, de developmental creep. Uh, everyone buys a piece of property. They want to expand. They, they, you know, they want to creep. They want to make it bigger. They want to make it bigger. And that's happened even in the 16 years that I've lived on the lake. I mean, you know, the, the 2,000 square foot house now becomes the 3,000 square foot house or the 4,500 square foot house. Everyone is maxing out the development on each piece of property because, you know, the, the piece of property is worth a lot of money. So you want to max out the, the physical attributes of the property. Um, the last thing we wanted to do is to make it look, uh, you know, like something on the shore, like the naked shore, where you know each house is 15 feet apart from the other house. This is not the nature of Columbia. So I think that's what LMAC was trying to address, and by doing by by doing the nutrient allocation plan, and by trying to limit to some extent that this incremental creep that we do find on the lake. Understood. I, I think we've we've worked hard and and always paid attention to that as a planning and zoning commission. You know, the, the um, very careful not to let the spacing between properties get too narrow. That's really. Yeah, I think but, the, thing, the thing that comes to my mind as the worst example is, is Groton Long Point. I don't know if people are familiar with that, but that is like- the I think worst, everyone is. That is the worst, in my mind, that is the worst possible development on, on a waterfront piece of property. It's just unbelievable what they've done down there and, and allowed to be done. It's just incredible. And part of that uh, uh, was because they allowed uh, sewers. Yeah, now they have year-round year round, uh, residents, yeah. Yeah, so once they start, the, when, once they put the sewers and the city water in, yep. it was crazy. Exactly. Although it's a nice place to live. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to look out my house and see another house 15 feet away. If you're looking out the front of the water, it's beautiful. I've been in some of the houses down there and it's gorgeous yeah, sitting, that's, looking out. That's only, that's only one direction. Look, look yep. out the side I agree. of the rear. I agree. No, I so, agree. Dan, and, try to Dan, park, and try to park your car down there. Hey, I'm a, I live in a rear lot and I look at all you people on the lake and say you're too close. <laughs> right. You do, Rich. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Anything else anyone wants to bring up about this this evening? No, oh, I'm good. Paula, thank you. Uh, Dan, thank you very much. Um, oh, you're welcome. Okay, so we're not going to really get into any possible changes other than having reviewed the input that we've gotten, and we'll, we'll continue this to our next meeting. Um, next item is communications and reports. Paula, anything? Nothing. Good night, everybody. Okay, thank you, Dan. I re Thanks, really Dan. appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next item, uh, open discussion, commission open discussion. Anything anyone would like to bring up? Hopefully this is the last meeting of the year. We'll see you all next year. Yeah, I don't see us having another <laughs> meeting this year uh, unless we have to. So the bus the folks were the bus folks were saying, well, maybe, maybe when is your next meeting? <laughs> He said, I think we can get it done for tonight. Let's get it. This was last a couple of weeks ago. They did a nice job with what they yeah, presented. They did, yeah. Uh, audience of citizens, anything from anybody? That's it. I'm going to make a motion to adjourn, but before we vote on it, I'd like to say happy holidays to everybody. And I hope, you know, stay safe. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, a year from now, we'll be having a happy holiday celebration with our families. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thanks, yeah. guys. Women, Please folks. be safe, everybody. I need a second to that. I was just going to say but EJ's not here. Bob Thanks, seconded. Larry. Bob, seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's a unanimous vote. Uh, Flo, thank you. Thanks, Happy Flo. holidays. Paula, thank you to all of you. I, I really appreciate everybody. Thank you. See everybody, see everybody next Enjoy. year. Happy year. Happy year. Next, year. Next, next year will be better. Year. Next year will be better. Thanks again. <laughs> <It will. laughs>